Good morning, I'm Kiffany, and thank you for joining us at MANA on this Palm Sunday. We're glad you're here, whether in person or online. Here's some news about the life of our church. A few weeks ago, you may have seen the debut of our own garage band singing about MANA Connect. What is MANA Connect? It's the simple system we use to communicate with our MANA family. The problem is we're missing a lot of phone numbers and have some wrong postal and email addresses. If there's urgent news or an emergency, we want to be able to reach all of you. Will you help us right now? If you're able, grab your phone and look at the prompts on the screen, then sign up. We'll wait with a little hold music and cute pictures. If you don't like typing on your phone, you can fill out a contact card at the Welcome Center. Thank you. Being a follower of Jesus can be serious, but it can also be serious fun. For example, in April, we're planning what is unofficially called Mom Apocalypse. It's a mother-son Nerf gun night full of flying, fluffy projectiles. It's for boys five and older, and goggles are optional. Oh, and there's pizza. Register online or in the lobby. P.S. This is a great opportunity to invite friends who do not have a church home. Today is Palm Sunday, and next week is Easter. Between now and then, we also have a special night of choral and orchestral worship and a Good Friday service. On Easter, we'll have a sunrise service at 6.30 a.m., followed by services at our regular times. Get the details at manakc.com slash Easter and invite a friend. Thank you for joining us today. If you need more information, stop by the Welcome Center or visit manakc.com. At MANA, we're here for God and there for you. Good morning. Welcome to MANA Fellowship Church. I don't know about you, but I was so excited to come to church this morning and after having first service, I'm even more excited. I was excited to come and worship the Lord together corporately. I was excited to hear the Word of God. I was excited to see some people that I haven't seen before and seen some people since I haven't seen in three days or so just to say hi. And uh, we're going to have a great time in worshiping the Lord today. I hope you're excited to be in the house of God. If you are, stand and meet somebody and that you don't know, and as we do every week, I'm going to test, I'm going to call out somebody and test you on it to see who you met. All right. You may be seated. Erica, you got to tell me. Oh, yeah, you can be seated too. But you you, you got to tell me who you met because I didn't get a chance to meet this gentleman this morning. Who'd you meet? Toby, how are you doing? I'm so glad you're here today. So, so glad all of you are here today. As uh, you saw in the video announcements uh, this week, uh, we have two special services, Thursday night and Friday night. And I hope that you can make both of those nights. Uh, there's going to be special uh, music, and Pastor Kevin is going to be bringing the word uh, Thursday night. And so that is Thursday night, right? Fr Thursday choir and Friday, you're bringing the word. Got it. Got, I had that reversed. So uh, 
hope that you all can make that. And then our sunrise service next Sunday is at 6.30. We're all going to gather out in the pavilion. Uh, it won't be our full service that we're going to have. We'll still have three services. But if you want to co come and join us and, and just praise the Lord and watch the sunrise and thank him for the resurrection and being alive, we're just going to have uh, read some scripture and sing some hymns. And then if you all want to go out to breakfast and come back uh, to one of the services. And as the video said, we hope you invite a friend to Easter. It's an easy invite. I've been talking to people all week uh, about Easter. I just talked to a couple yesterday that I met at a wedding that we did yesterday. And they don't have a church home. And they've kind of been looking for a church home and said they haven't been to church forever. But they promised that they're going to come on Easter and uh, it's, it's kind of an easy invite. Uh, a lot of times people, that's the only time they'll come to church. And if they come, they get to hear the gospel. Many are still here today that came a year ago Easter for the first time. And so invite all your friends to Easter. I just want to say it is absolutely, on behalf of our whole team here, our ministry team, it is absolutely a privilege um, to shepherd this church. And we, we get a great joy out of shepherding, and we've done a lot of shepherding this week. We, we've had uh, deaths this week, people in the hospital this week, uh, a wedding that we performed uh, this week, and our wedding ceremony. And, and so we, we've run the gamut, and that's like every week. Sometimes we run the gamut of birth, death, marriage, <laughs> the whole gamut uh, of life in one week. Uh, but it is a privilege and a joy, and you all make it make it so easy uh, to pastor. So we just want to say thank you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless this service. Father, thank you for your great love to us, Lord. I thank you for already just the ability to praise and worship you first service, Lord. And, and I ask that that praise and worship would continue. And God, I ask that all of our focus uh, would be on you, Lord. And and, and the scripture that we're reading today that Pastor Kevin is bringing, I, I, I just pray that it would move hearts, Lord, and that uh, we would be able to apply it to our lives and that we would walk away from here differently than when we walked in. And we'll give you all the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We're actually going to... Thank you. Christina just reminded me by running up on stage here. <laughs> so we, we have uh, talked about life skills class, and, and we've had a couple of meetings on that. And uh, life skills is any skill that you have that you think someone else might want to learn. We're going to hold those class on Saturdays. It can go all the way from mechanics, light mechanics. Uh, we got a call this week that someone said, well, I can do uh, teach people electrician work. Uh, just the basics of it, basics of plumbing, uh, gardening, uh, finances. Uh, but we're going to have our first one, and uh, Christina Lewis is going to tell you about our first life skill class. Yes, good morning. So I've been working alongside Shannon McCord, and we're planning our first life skills class to be um, health and wellness. It'll be April 6th, not March, almost said March, April 6th at the porch from 9 to noon. It's open to anyone ages 14 and older. We will not be um, talking about diet hacks. We will not be doing punishing extreme workouts, um, but we'll be having fun moving. We'll learn and define biblical health and wellness, including physical, mental, spiritual. Uh, we know from God's word that we are wonderfully and fearfully made that marvelous are his works, and that my soul knows very well. Um, worst case scenario, you come and have a really fun morning and learn absolutely nothing, but maybe you come and have a blast and take home something that you can apply to the rest of your life. Uh, so make sure you wear your tennis shoes, your comfy clothes, and sign up in the lobby so we're ready to have you, and join us April 6, 9 to noon. All right, are you ready to worship? It is good to be in the house of the Lord today, so would you stand and let's praise him. Yeah. 
worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God won all the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. I've got it surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise.
for this service. So today is Palm Sunday where we celebrate when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and the city celebrated him as the coming king and the coming Messiah. <clears throat> and I forgot to mention earlier that uh, we have a special family up here or group of families. So about once a month we have a family-led worship service where we invite the children of our worship team members who are also skilled in their craft and learning, we invite them to join us on stage because here at MANA in all areas of ministry, we really strongly believe that the best way to train up the next generation is to bring them alongside of us and have them do ministry with us. And they're just um, a stellar uh, group of children here and uh, really um, stellar families who are setting a wonderful example. So. Um, three generations represented on stage today, actually, in one family. So we have the grandfather and the father and the mother, and then these two beautiful girls are theirs, and then a mother and a daughter here. Uh, so <clears throat> this next portion is in collaboration with our children's choir and with our youth choir. And guys, you can, ladies and gentlemen, you can come up now, if you would please, and join us on stage. <clears throat> And a video that you're about to see was done in collaboration with the children of Discovery Homeschool Academy. If you didn't know, every week during the weekdays, there are hundreds of kids who come in here, homeschool children, and they have classes here in all subjects. And it's a very wonderful ministry that happens every week in this church. And the children of Discovery Homeschool Academy put together this beautiful video featuring uh, Bible verses of the names of Jesus. Enjoy. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. The tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. 
For us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk into the darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. I priest said unto him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say it unto all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his head for the sheep. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Do not weep. See, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll of the seven seals. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war, his eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. God of Jacob, great I am, King of angels, Son of man, voice of many waters, song of heaven's throne, louder than the thunder, make you glory.
portion of our service. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, our wonderful counselor and our mighty God and our Prince of Peace and our everlasting Father and all the other wonderful names that we just sang about. Truly, you are indescribable, Lord Jesus. I pray that um, you would use this next portion of the service and the word that you've placed in Pastor Kevin's heart to pierce like a sword and go exactly where it needs to go. And we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whew. It's hard to follow something like that. So you know, some of you are probably like, we don't want you to, but I want to try it anyways. So, because God is good and it's exciting. And I, I love this time of year. I really, really do. And I hope 
truly, like, I want to invite personally each and every one of you on Thursday night and Friday night to come out to our Holy Week uh, experiences, the orchestra, and then our Good Friday event. Because as we've talked about before, this time of year, this, this is our time of year. Uh, I know we get really hyped up for Christmas and everyone loves Christmas. And as we've said before, Christmas seems to run from October 31st to February 14th. You know, and people got Christmas parties and gatherings with family and friends all through January and February too. And it's like, oh, Valentine's Day. Oh, I guess it is that time of year. We got to switch gears. And then it's just like Easter. And we got Easter Day. And we come and we go, oh, everybody shows up in their Easter best. You know, if you guys were like me growing up and your mom always bought you some weird pastel color, bright, you look like an Easter egg walking in with your little clip on tie. And it was like, yeah, and you got your little dress. I didn't have to wear a dress. We weren't like doing that when I was young. But some of the ladies, you know, would wear the dresses and it was all fancy. And it was that one day and you're like, we're doing this wrong. Like this, this morning, I want you guys to hear uh, what God is doing. And I want us to really be excited for this week. And I want to see us start to do this, not just as a local church, as man of fellowship, but I want to see the church universal get on board for this idea of what we're doing here during Holy Week and what we're doing coming up to Easter. Because again, if you take the birth stories out of the gospels, you, you lose a couple of chapters of Luke, you lose a couple of uh, chapters of Matthew and maybe one or two verses uh, in Mark and John and not much, but if you take the, the, the last week of Jesus as we're going to see, if you take that out, you lose everything. And it's the resurrection, it's uh, next Sunday, it's Easter that changes the world. When you read the gospels and you see uh, the church, you see the disciples after the death of Jesus, when he's arrested in the garden, they all flee and they scatter and they go to the upper room and they just sit there and they just wait and they're scared. It says for the fear of the Jews, like so much so on an Easter morning, they send the ladies out and go, hey, ladies, you, you go to the tomb. We're just going to hang out here just in case. Like too afraid to even go to see the tomb and to see if Jesus is still there as his word said he was, as his prophecies, as his own teaching said he would not be there. But then you see in Acts, when Jesus comes, I mean, they're so scared, Jesus has to walk through a wall because they've locked the door. Like no one's getting in. Jesus is like, watch this. And he walks through the wall and he comes in and they're like, this is different and new. I don't know about all this, right? And so they're sitting there and Jesus tells them who he is and he shows them his hands and his feet and his side and he tells them about what's coming up and then after that you go into Acts and they're just going out and changing the world. And what changed? The resurrection. Jesus is a risen savior that we serve. Jesus is the risen Lord that we serve and I want us to get excited about that and so I want us to, to really see what God is doing through that process. And so if you have your Bible, we'll get to it here in a minute. Turn to Zechariah. We're going to take a little bit of a break from the Gospel of Luke. We're going to touch on it some uh, in the Gospels at large. But we're going to jump off of these Old Testament passages, these prophecies, to see what God is doing. And so Zechariah chapter 9 will be our jumping off text, but we're going to kind of be all over the place as we tell this story of what's going on here on Palm Sunday. As we saw the kids with their palm branches, it's also known in the Gospels as the triumphal entry. It's the start of Holy Week or Passion Week. That word passion deriving from the Greek uh, pasco and the Latin pati, meaning to suffer. It's the suffering week of Jesus, the last week of Jesus's life, starting here at the, or the Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry going all the way through his death, his resurrection, and his post-resurrection experiences in the gospel. It's an important part of the gospel story. In Matthew and Mark, it takes up a third of their gospel uh, Matthew's chapter 21 through 28 are all the last week of Jesus's life. Uh, Mark 11 through 16 are all the last week of Jesus's life. John and his gospel dedicates half of his gospel from chapter 12 to chapter 21 is the last week of Jesus's life and his post-resurrection appearances. Luke starts, his, starts Jesus's march to Jerusalem in chapter 9 and verse 51 and Jesus finally gets there in chapter 19 and he spends the rest of the gospel. And if you, as you'll, you'll see in the next few weeks when we get back to Luke, some of Luke's later chapters are like 70 some verses long. So he dedicates a lot of space to the last week of Jesus's life. And so we understand that these events are primary to the gospel. They are the gospel message because everything that Jesus did 
prior to his death and his resurrection, if he's just a good guy, if he's just a good teacher who came to show us some important things and some good ways to live life, but he didn't raise from the dead, then nothing he did really matters. Nothing else that he did in his life would matter. He wouldn't even be, as we say, he wouldn't even be a good moral teacher if he didn't raise from the dead because he'd be a liar and you can't trust liars to tell morals. But because he raised from the dead, because he is a risen savior, we can trust and believe all the things that he did before that. And so this Palm Sunday, I want us to see things that are going on simultaneously. There's at least two things going on simultaneously as Jesus comes into Jerusalem and what the purpose is for those things. And we're gonna look at those two things in order. First, we're gonna spend some time focusing on the Palm Sunday itself. Like what is this day as it's laid out in scripture? But then we're gonna go back in the past as well and see all that was going on and all that was coming up through this process. And so first we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem with the crowds going before him and they're following behind him and they're roaring and they're hailing him as king. The scene would have been loud, it would have been joyful and hopeful and awe-inspiring as Jesus rides in and the people that are coming down from Galilee with him, they're heading to Jerusalem for the Passover. And the scripture says that there was others in Jerusalem that saw the procession, they came out to meet him. And they began to sing the Psalms of Hallel, the praise Psalms that were so familiar around the time of Passover. And they're singing and shouting out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the, in the name and the throne of his power and his father David. And they're singing it as a refrain back and forth. The people in the front are screaming out and the people in the back are answering. And you can just imagine yourself walking through this time with Jesus and seeing all that is going on and just seeing the joy that everyone has because at, at last, finally, they're hoping that this is the moment that God is going to fulfill his promise to Israel to redeem them from and free them from Roman occupation and reestablish the throne of David. It would have been a time of high spirits and soaring praises flowing out all around Jerusalem. But what is it about Jesus on this donkey that causes this reaction from the people. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that Jesus is the one who initiates this series of events, this sequence of events. Remember, he tells the disciples on that morning, go into this nearby city and you're gonna find a donkey tied up there, untie it and bring it to me. And if anyone asks you, what are you doing? Say, the master has need of it. Jesus has a purpose and a plan in mind. And as king, he has the right to procure anything that he desires to fulfill his purpose. Kings of old had this right. As lords of the land, they could go to anyone at any time and say, I need your stuff for my purpose. And since you were subject to the king, you had to give those things up because if not, the king would kill you. Jesus wasn't going to do that, but Jesus has the right over his subjects. And so they bring this donkey to him and it says that they began to lay their coats on the donkey and on the ground and wave palm branches and lay them on the ground, preparing this way for the king. And they have this idea in mind going back to when David was about to die and he told the high priest at that time, Zadok and prophet, the prophet Nathan and one of his mighty men, Benaniah, to take Solomon and put him on his own mule and take him down to Gion and anoint him as king over Israel and Judah. And from that moment, that was the standard way that Jewish kings would ride into their anointing and to be hailed as king was they were coming low and humble because they were to be secondary kings to the great high king that was God. And so they weren't the kings on the white horse riding in as conquering heroes. They were humble kings. They were servant kings under God. And so Jesus follows this pattern as he walks in to Jerusalem, he announces himself in the same way. We remember in the gospels, there's a couple of times where the people came and wanted to make Jesus king by force. And they're like, you're doing a lot of great things. We wanna make you king by force. And Jesus says, no, I don't wanna do that. I often imagine those moments when Jesus is doing that. Like, how does he do this? How does he walk? They tried the same thing. They tried to kill him at one point. They tried to throw him off the cliff at Nazareth and they backed him up and he was standing at the precipice and they're about to push him over and he just goes, not my time. He just walks through the middle. Of how did you get everyone in the crowd to stop wanting to kill you? I don't understand that, but he's Jesus. It wasn't his time. And the same when they come to make him king, he's like, no. And they're like, oh, 
okay, I guess we're not gonna do that now. And they just all leave and just let him alone. But now it's his time. Those weren't his time. Those weren't the moments that he was coming to be king, but now it was time to announce his kingdom. And so he walks into Jerusalem, ready to reveal himself and reveal all things to the people and fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament surrounding his final moments. And that's how he begins this week in Zechariah chapter nine, verses nine through 11. The prophecy rang out this way. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the bow of war will be cut off and he will speak peace to the nations and his dominion will be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. In the manner of ancient kings and in fulfillment of prophecy, Jesus rides into Jerusalem. The crowd as they're going with him is anticipating this clash with the Romans. They're ready for this exciting moment. The religious leaders, as we saw a couple of weeks ago in Luke's gospel, are trying to shut the whole thing down. Jesus, tell your disciples, tell these children to be quiet. I love Jesus' response. I can tell the children to be quiet, but if they do, the rocks are gonna cry out. So take your pick. Because the king is coming and someone is going to worship. Either the people are going to worship or the creation is going to worship because it's that time. So take your pick. Which would you rather have? But someone is going to worship today. The disciples on their part, though, aren't quite sure what's going on. As John relates this story in John chapter 12, he says in verse 16, and I love the honesty here, these things, all the, the cult and the prophecies and writing in, all of these things, says his disciples did not understand at first. I feel that, disciples. Sometimes you're looking, I'm like, I don't, I don't understand this at first. Somebody please tell me what's going on here. But again, John finishes that and this is why this week is so important and next Sunday is so vastly important because John finishes that and says, yes, we didn't understand it at first when it was first happening and we were watching it unfold right before our eyes. But once Jesus was raised from the dead, we remembered these things. We remembered what Jesus had done. Again, the resurrection changed everything for them. And still yet many in those in Jerusalem, according to Matthew's account, as Jesus was writing in, kept asking the question, who is this? Who is this that is riding in with this pomp and circumstance? And that's a question for us this morning as well. Who is this Jesus? He is checking off all the boxes for a king of Israel. He's close to God. He obeys the law. He has amassed this loyal following. He's riding in on a donkey and he immediately goes into Jerusalem and he goes up to the temple. And the people would have been anticipating he's going to the temple because if you're going to lead a revolution against Rome, if you're going to lead a revolt, if you're going to be the king, you need the entire Israel nation behind you. So you go to the temple and you in invoke the religious leaders and you get them on your side and you go to the only standing army in Israel. Because Israel was an occupied nation, they weren't allowed to have a standing army except for in the temple, the temple guards, those who at the end of the week will see arrest Jesus but that's the only military force that they have. And so you would think that Jesus is going to the temple to get the religious leaders and get the military on his side and say, let's go take over. Let's go after Pontius Pilate. Let's go after Rome. And I just like how Mark puts this in Mark chapter 11 as he tells the story. He says, Jesus entered Jerusalem. Yes, he's in Jerusalem. He's going to the temple. Woohoo! we're gonna go to war. This is amazing. And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the 12 because it was late. That, that's what the word says. So you can imagine being in there and you're all excited and you're hyped up. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna on the highest. And Jesus walks in and goes, it's getting late, guys. I'm going, I want to go back. And he just leaves. And you're like, well, that was, that was anticlimactic. We were really excited, we were praising. You can imagine just the air coming out of the collective room as everybody just stops and looks and goes, so nothing? Like, nope, nothing. 
We'll come back later. But it's anticlimactic because Jesus isn't there for political acclaim. Jesus didn't come to Jerusalem to do battle with Rome. Jesus had another purpose in mind. Jesus had another purpose in mind, and we're excited for that this morning. So why come to the temple at all? And why do it all on Passover? Why do it in the week of Passover? And that's what we want to see because the temple and Passover, as we'll explain, represent and remind the people of God's presence and God's promise of peace. God's presence among his people and his promise of peace. We see this in the first indication of this in verse 10 of Zechariah's prophecy. It says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the bow of war will be cut off and he will speak peace to the nations. Jesus says, and the Old Testament prophecies say, when he comes into his kingdom, he's not coming with weapons of war. He's not coming with horses and bows. He's coming in in peace. He's coming to preach peace. So much so he says, I'm gonna cut off all the weapons of war so no one will be mistaken what I'm coming for. He enters in to make peace. It's what Jesus says as he rides in in Luke's telling of the story in Luke chapter 19. He's riding over and as he crosses the hill of the Mount of Olives and he looks down on Jerusalem, it says that he began to weep over the city. And he says this in verse 42 of chapter 19, if you had known this day, even you, the things which make for peace, the things which make for peace. Israel's problem wasn't Rome. Israel's problem wasn't that they were occupied by Rome. Israel's problem was that they, that they were at war with God in the inner person. Israel's problem is the same problem that we have. We're at war with God in the inner person and we need a savior. So while Jesus did enter Jerusalem as king, he didn't come to make war. William Lane Craig writes it this way. Jesus is deliberately and provocatively claiming to be the promised king of Israel, but one who will inaugurate his reign of peace. Paul writes it in Ephesians 2, 14 through 17. He says, he himself, that is Jesus, is our peace. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who are near. Jesus is the Prince of Peace who came to be the sacrifice of peace offering to Yahweh so that we might be made acceptable before him. Jesus came to make a new covenant by his blood. As Paul writes in Colossians 1.20, Jesus made peace through his blood of the cross, made peace through the blood of his cross, whereby we would experience the grace of God and live in his presence here and now, but also for eternity. If we accept and have the blood poured out upon us and accept Jesus for who he is, we can live in the presence of God here in this place, on this earth in the short time that we're here, but also for eternity. And that's what Paul says, and that's what Jesus says, and that's what the story is saying, and that leads us to the second place, the second reason why Jesus came in the temple and at Passover in verse 11, it says this, because of the blood of my covenant with you, because of the blood of my covenant with you. There are two other places in scripture where we find this language. In Exodus chapter 24 and verse eight, and at the last supper as recorded by Matthew in Matthew 26 and Mark chapter 14. In Exodus, Moses had gotten the commandments from the Lord. He had gone up on the mountain and he had gotten the commandments from God and he wrote them in the book of the covenant. And he comes down and he reads the commandments. He reads the book of the covenant to the people. You guys have it easy. You guys have it good. Let me tell you, how would you like it if I just stood up here and just began to read the first five books of the Bible to you without stopping? And you guys have it really nice and easy, okay? Because back, back in ancient times, the teacher got to sit down and the students had to stand up. So we got this backwards here, all right? Or we could pull an Ezra, uh, when Ezra, as they rebuild the temple and they've laid the foundations and he stands up or he comes out to read the book of the law and he reads the entire thing for six and a half hours while the people just stood there and listened. Some of you are like, I can't go six and a half minutes. And I get it. I understand that. Sometimes I get distracted too, right? 
But that's what Moses had done. He'd come out and he had read the entire book of covenant to the people. And he said, do you guys agree to obey? And they're like, we will obey. And they had already sacrificed a bull and, and sprinkled the blood on the altar and the rest of the blood that was from the bull, from the sacrifice. As the people said, we will obey. Moses took the blood and he began to sprinkle it on the people. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant. At the last supper, Jesus says that the blood he's about to pour out on the cross, the blood that we represent in the cup at communion, at the Lord's supper, that last cup, he says, this is my blood, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the sins and the forgiveness of sins. It's that blood that we see there that is poured out at that meal. And it's the blood of the covenant, the new covenant that Jesus is referring to, the new covenant that we see in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, this is what God says. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the days I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, know the Lord for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. I will forgive their iniquity. The blood that Jesus poured out was to forgive the iniquity and the sin of each and every one of us. And so Jesus chooses the Passover, again, because it's a time when Israel would remember God's promises made to be with them and to deliver them. And it was a time when Jesus was going to set up his new covenant, the covenant by his blood. It was gonna be a time where humans could now in a different way, be washed in the blood of the lamb and have their sins forgiven and be at peace with God. So Jesus comes not just to be the, the king and roaring in like a lion, but he comes to be the Passover lamb for all of Israel and for all the nations. And through the process, unknowingly and unwittingly, the crowds and the religious leaders play their part in the drama to perfection. And that's the next thing I want us to notice as Jesus is our Passover lamb in our text this morning and in our, our story this morning. We go back to Exodus chapter 12 when God is setting up the Passover for Israel to escape Egypt. God tells Moses that each Israelite on the 10th of Nisan is to go out and select a lamb for their family and they're to bring it into their house and they are to bring in a male that is unblemished, a perfect sacrifice, and they're to go out and get it on the 10th of Nisan, and they're to bring it in, and they're to keep it in their house and take care of it until the 14th of Nisan. And then they're to get up and kill it, and at that time, they're to spread the blood on the doorpost so that when the death angel comes through, he will pass over the house. That's how they get the name. Very simple. I like simple things. Like, how do we get Passover? Because he passed over the house. All right, I can deal with that. Keep it simple. That's my line, All right? And so later in the law, we see that again, the lamb was to be a perfect unblemished lamb is to have all of its blood poured out. And to, uh, in later times when the tabernacle and the temple are there, it's the, the blood is to be sprinkled on the altar and none of the bones of the lamb are supposed to be broken. Throughout the generations, the process stayed relatively the same, except the blood wasn't put on the doorpost because there was no death angel passing over. Again, it was put on the altar and sometimes on the person, the sprinkling of the blood. But one of the major differences was that the Passover lamb was to be inspected by the religious leaders. The religious leaders had allowed for some time some bad sacrifices to come through and God got onto them. Go read Malachi chapter one and you'll see this. People were bringing blind and lame and sick animals to the sacrifice. And, Jesus, and God looks at him and says, would you give this to the authorities over you? Would you give this to your governors? Like, would you give those in charge of you here on earth, would you give them bad sacrifice? Would you give them bad gifts? It's like, of course you wouldn't. He's like, so why are you bringing those to me? And so they got in trouble for it and God was very upset with them. 
And so from that process on, from that time on, the religious leaders would then inspect the sacrifice that was brought in. They would take the lamb and they would expect it, they would look at it, make sure it was okay. So much so they wanted to make sure everybody had good sacrifices that even at times they had their own priestly shepherds who would raise perfect sacrifices so that you could buy one and you could know that it's been inspected, it's kosher, it's as it should be. And that process was going on. And so this time of Palm Sunday, this time of this triumphal entry, you guys are smart, you're following the story and you're like, this isn't gonna be a surprise, right? Palm Sunday, the day that we're celebrating today, on the Jewish calendar would be the 10th of Nisan, would be the day that God told Moses to tell the people to go out and select their perfect lamb. And we have this scene of this crowd coming into Jerusalem, hailing Jesus and those in Jerusalem coming out and selecting the perfect lamb, selecting their king, selecting their Messiah. And what do they do? They bring him into Jerusalem, the house of God, the place where God dwells in the temple and they bring him in. And for the next four days, as we've seen in Luke's gospel, as we've been studying it, the high priest and the religious leaders inspect Jesus and they ask him questions. Where'd you get your authority? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? This lady who, a hypothetical lady who is married to a guy and has uh, married seven brothers and they all die and then she dies. Who's what? I have questions about that lady, by the way. I don't know if she, because they're like in heaven in eternity, who she's gonna, like, I don't know if she's making it. She lost seven husbands. I watch too many crime dramas, I guess. I've been a therapist too long. I'm skeptical of a woman who has seven husbands and they all die and she doesn't. I'm just saying, that's a side note. But Jesus came to save her too, right? Whew. So they ask him all these questions and they inspect him. And at the end of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of the gospels say the same thing when they were done inspecting him and they had asked all these questions and he had answered correctly. It said they dare not ask him any more questions. He had passed all the tests. And so the religious leaders uh, unwittingly and unknowingly have stated that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. He is the unblemished one. And then he goes on trial before Pilate and Pilate at, twice in the gospel of John says, I find no guilt in him. Pilate being the representative of Rome in Jerusalem, Pilate being the representative of the Gentile nations says, I find no guilt in him. And so Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, not just for the Jew, but also for the Gentile, because no one can find fault in him. And then four days later on the 14th of Nisan, Jesus is taken outside of the city and he's crucified as a sacrifice for your sins and for mine. Jesus is our Passover lamb. He's our Passover lamb that's been sacrificed. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Peter says it in 1 Peter 1, 19. He is the Passover lamb. He is our Passover lamb that has been sacrificed, but he's also our messianic hope. He's the hope of the story of God. He is the hope that God has been preparing from the beginning. As Daniel Block, the commentator says, the messianic hope is a single line that begins in broadest terms with God's promise of victory over the serpent through the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15. And then it's narrowed successively to the seed of Abraham in Genesis 22.8, to the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, 9 and 10, where we get the title, the lion of the tribe of Judah, because the scepter was not to depart from Judah. He was going to be the kingly line. And it goes to the stem of Jesse and to the house and the dynasty of David. And you go, well, David had many sons. David had many children after him. Just read the genealogies of Jesus in Matthew and Luke. And you see all these people that come after David. Which one is it? And it finally narrows down to the suffering and slain servant of Yahweh, the one that Isaiah 53 describes, and it can only describe one person. And so that's why Jesus picks the temple and Passover to reveal himself and inaugurate the kingdom. Jesus comes into the temple at Passover because the temple, like the Garden of Eden and the tabernacle in the wilderness, was the place where heaven and earth overlapped. It was the place where God's presence dwelt. He chose the Passover because it was a time of remembrance when God's presence was among his people. 
We see in the story of the garden. Again, my students will say this, and I just love having students up here too. Just a side note, just awesome. But you never get out of Genesis. When you go back to Genesis 1 and 2, and God is walking in the garden with Adam and Eve, and he's meeting with them. And then when they sin, God is gone. God leaves. His presence has to depart because he can't walk and live among unholy people anymore. He can dwell with those who are redeemed and those who are righteous because they are forgiven and they are uh, saved by his grace, but he can't deal with sinners. He can't live with the sinners who are not redeemed. And so his presence departs. And then he picks this family and he draws this narrow pathway to relationship with them of how salvation is going to come. And he does it through his wanderings in the wilderness with them, in the pillar of fire, in the pillar of cloud. And he's walking with them. And when they establish the tabernacle, God comes in his presence and his glory fills the tabernacle. And then when they build the temple in Second Chronicles, you see Solomon's prayer of dedication and the cloud comes and fills the temple. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and he filled the temple with his presence. But then in Ezekiel chapter 10, before Israel is destroyed by Babylon, the presence of God departs from the temple. It has to, or the temple can't be destroyed. And God's symbolically saying, my presence is no longer among you. And they come back after the captivity and they rebuild the temple and they're excited and, and shouting praises of joy and some are weeping and the presence of God never shows up again because God says, I'm gonna bring a different presence not just my spirit being there, not just a cloud being there, not just an ark being there. I myself am going to come. I myself am going to come. And so in John's gospel, when we see it, it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt there literally means to tabernacle, to pitch his tent. God says, I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna pitch my tent with you. I'm gonna be in your presence. And just like the tabernacle in the wilderness, Jesus becomes the walking tabernacle. Jesus becomes the walking temple. No longer do you have to go to Jerusalem and have the priest sacrifice for you. Jesus says, you can come to me and I will come to you. And there's a place of forgiveness and there's a place of healing and there's a place of restoration in the presence of God. And that's what N.T. Wright says about the temple and about the story of Passover it says building the temple was associated with the larger story of victory over enemies, liberation for the people. It was the Exodus narrative, the Passover narrative all over again. And we shouldn't forget a key element in the Passover narrative was always the presence of Israel's God himself with his people in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And then apparently more permanently in the tabernacle, Passover implies presence. Passover implies presence, the presence of God here on earth, the presence of God with us, the presence of God in our life. So according to the gospels, then Jesus saw his death as a redemptive sacrifice, like the Passover sacrifice, and he himself as a sin bearer, like Isaiah's servant of the Lord, inaugurating like the Mosaic sacrifices, a fresh covenant between God and people. Jesus, when he knew his hour had come, came roaring into Jerusalem like the lion of Judah that he is. He fulfilled ancient prophecies perfectly and completely. He withstood the inspection of the religious leaders throughout his ministry and especially during the last week of his life. But then he goes out, as Isaiah wrote about him in Isaiah 53, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. Jesus came the first time as the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He came to defeat the enemies called sin and death. The problems that we have in our life are because of sin and our fear of death. And Jesus came and the cross to defeat the power of sin in our life. The cross tells us that sin has no more power over our life. He came to deal with sin's power and sin's penalty. That is, if we are in Christ, if we have accepted the blood of Jesus over our life, we no longer have to sin. We will because we're still fallen people. We still have our sin nature, but we don't have to because we can live in the presence of God and the power of his spirit. And then Jesus was buried and three days later, he rose from the grave, defeating death. 
We no longer, as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, we no longer have to fear death. Death has no power over us. Yes, we may grow old, and yes, we may suffer in this life as we lead up to our death, or we may experience a tragedy at the hands of somebody out there in the world, but we don't have to fear that process if we're in Christ because the presence of God is with us. And we can walk joyfully even to that place and go, I am ready to see my Savior. I'm ready to be set free. I'm ready to go home and spend eternity in his presence rejoicing that he is the king over my life and I have given him everything that I have. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Jesus came the first time as the Passover lamb, taking away the sin of the world. But he will come again. And when he comes again, he's coming as a conquering king on that white horse, leading the host of heaven with him. And he's coming to establish on the earth his eternal rule and reign. Are you ready for that day? Are you at peace with that day? Are you at peace with the moment when Jesus returns to receive you unto himself? Are you holding on to that promise that he made that his presence would be with you and that you can see him once again? If you're here this morning and this is the first time you've heard of this Jesus, the the gospel of Jesus, the one who was prophesied of old, who was sent by the creator God, sent to this earth, to take on human flesh, to live a perfect life, to give himself as a sacrifice for your sin. As you see the cross and you hear about that cruel cross, the torture that Jesus experienced, the ugliness of sin put on display, your sin, my sin, the sins of the world and his blood was poured out so that you might have forgiveness of your sin, so that you may be made right with him again, so you can have peace between you and your creator. If that's a story you've heard before, but it's never landed on you, it's never changed your life, and you wanna experience that change this morning, I'm gonna give you this opportunity in this place, in this time right now. You can meet Jesus in a real and personal way, this one who wants to make his presence known and establish his presence in your life. That's you this morning, you say, I wanna know this Jesus in a real and personal way. I want my sins to be cleansed. I want to be forgiven. I want to be reconciled. We're not going to embarrass you and have you come up here. We're just going to ask you to just raise your hand. Say, that's me this morning. And hold it up there. And we'll have one of our counselors and pastors come to you. And we'll take you to an office and we'll show you from the word of God how you can know this one. Maybe you just want to run up here and throw yourself at the mercy of God and say, I've been hiding and running from you for too long, and I'm sorry. I've heard your voice. I've heard you speaking, and I know I need a relationship with you. Is there anyone here this morning and say, I want to know Jesus in that way? those of you that are acknowledging that you know Jesus, that you have that personal relationship, are you at peace with him this morning? Is his presence 
dwelling richly in your life? Is it making a difference? Have you welcomed him as King and Lord of your life? Are you ready for that day when he comes again? Are you ready for that moment when he returns and makes all things new? Do you look at the cross and see your sin? Do you look at the resurrection and see the hope that we have? The power of God to set you free from whatever you came in with. Jesus is still saving lives and changing lives today. His power is still real. His presence is still real in this place and it can be in your life. Whatever you need to do this morning, whatever the spirit is speaking to you, this is your time. This is your moment. Our God and our Father, we thank you. Father, all we can do is say thank you for the things that we don't deserve. Father, we say thank you for the things that, God, we are not worthy of. We are not worthy of your son's sacrifice. We're not worthy of the precious blood that was spilt, not on our own. But God, you love us so much that you sent Jesus anyway. And Father, you watched as his blood was poured out because it's only by the shedding of blood that there's the forgiveness of sins. But Father, we thank you for that empty tomb. Father, we thank you that three days later he rose from the grave in power and majesty and glory. And that Father, he is seated at your right hand right now, waiting for you to send him back to receive us. God, we thank you. We have nothing to say but praise the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. We're so grateful for who you are and what you've done in our lives. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand and sing with us? There aren't words enough to say thank you, but we can give the Lord all of our worship. Except for a heart singing high, Ooh. 
let's go out today with a hallelujah on our lips. We hope to see you back this Thursday for our Easter concert, our choir and orchestra concert, and then on Good Friday for our special service that evening. Go and be blessed in the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us today.